In 2017, it is a year which will require a lot of faith. Hallelujah. It is not really a tough year for those who are working with God. If you are working with God, it's not a really a tough year. It's a year for you to begin to manifest what God has deposited in you. But if, if for those who are living in the flesh, it will be a very difficult year. If you are living in the flesh, they will experience a lot of traumatic, I mean, kind of situations and frustration as well. Hallelujah. And one thing which I know for sure is that um, it's a year when, this, when the Almighty God is busy doing certain things to this country. He's busy realigning Zimbabwe as a nation. And uh, God was showing me the first half of 2017. It will be very tough economically. I don't want to deceive you. I know some people, they will say, a year of prosperity will be flying all over the place like butterflies. But I only speak what I've been shown by the Spirit of God. So, I mean, but God is able to sustain those who belong to him. If you belong to Jesus, just lift up your hand. If you belong to Jesus, if you say my life belongs to Jesus Christ, it means all of us here, we belong to Jesus Christ. Let us clap hands for ourselves. <laughs> Hallelujah. So since you belong to Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is seated on the throne in heaven. He is not going to forget you. I want you to say, Jesus Christ is not going to forget me. For those who are going to live by faith, 2017 is the year when they are going to prosper more than any other year. Do you understand? For those who decide to live by faith. But if you decide to live by the systems of this world and you de decide to live your life in the natural, to try to figure out solutions to problems in the natural, you are going to be frustrated because there will be a lot of negative situations. There will be a lot of negative situations next year, in 2017. I know a lot of people will be would be making noise on Sunday very soon, on Sunday the 1st of January. A lot of people will be making noise, drinking beer, and making a lot of noise for us, beating pots and doing all sorts of funny things. They will be making that noise because they don't know what 2017 contains. Hallelujah. If they knew what 2017 contains, if they could see the things which God is showing some of us, they would start fasting before 2017 so that by the time it arrives, it finds you prepared. Because you don't prepare for trouble when trouble has already come. It will be too late. I want you to say you don't prepare for trouble when trouble has already come. You prepare for trouble in advance. Yes, you have to prepare for trouble in advance. If you try to prepare for the farming season, when it is already raining, you start to look for seeds, and you start to prepare for the plowing season. When, I mean, when it's already time to plow, and uh, it will be already too late. Hallelujah. A successful farmer prepares in advance for the farming season. I want us to say a successful farmer prepares in advance for the farming period. Say a successful Christian prepares in advance for adversity. So when bad times come, they must find you prepared. Hallelujah. Let me show you something. We are still sharing the message. We are concluding the message that we started last week on the nature of faith. Say the nature of faith. The nature of faith. Say the nature, the nature of faith. I want us to go to the word of God to Matthew chapter 7. Hallelujah. I'm not going to be long because of the other activities that we, we have to do. I don't want us to start to finish off the 
the lunch, I mean the meal, when it is already evening or dark, we want to do everything when it is still, when there is still natural light. Hallelujah. So I'm going to be brief. Hallelujah. Let us go to Matthew chapter 7 from verse 24. Matthew 7 verse 24. It says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Hallelujah. 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 Do we hear what the Lord Jesus Christ is saying? The Lord Jesus Christ is telling us that if we hear his sayings and we do them, we are like a man, a wise man, who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But do you realize that the act of building a house on top of a rock, it is done before the rain comes. Do you realize? According to the story that Jesus Christ is giving us there. So your faith has to start operating before adversity comes. The reason why a lot of Christians, their lives, they don't amount to anything in terms of victory. It is because we try to operate our faith when problems are already besetting us. And faith does not work like that. You develop faith and capacity when there are no problems or when there are minimal problems. You feed yourself with the word of God. You pray. You saturate yourself with the presence of the Holy Spirit. You don't go around looking for people who are filled with the Holy Spirit when you are already in trouble. It will be too late. By then, demons will be having what is known as a head start. You know a head start? A head start. It's called a head start. That's why they do it like that. But there is something which is called a head start. Say a head start. If you, if you are used to reacting to problems when they are already there, I mean, you would have lost what is known as a head start to demons because problems are, are orchestrated by demons. All the negative situations which you are experiencing, one way or the other, we can link them to demons. Either what demons were doing against your descendants, I mean, against the people who preceded you, your predecessors. Hallelujah. You as a descendant of your predecessors, you will be experiencing the effects of the wrong decisions. Some of us, the reason why we are in trouble is because of wrong decisions which were made by our four parents. But now we have it within ourselves by the word of God. If we listen to what Jesus Christ is saying, to shape our future. I want you to say I, I have it within myself to be able to shape my future. Say I'm able to shape my future. Hallelujah. You are able to shape your future, not when you are already in trouble. But you can shape your, you have to shape your future when you are not in trouble. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You don't start to create faith for healing when you are already sick. When you are already sick, you must look for someone who has got faith so that they pray for you. It will be too late for, for you to Try to activate faith for healing when you are already feeling sick. When you are already feeling sick, you must look for a person who is not sick, who has got a stronger and a higher level of faith than yourself, who is going to assist you to come out of your situation. Hallelujah. They made sure we had a higher level of faith. 
when we listen to the conversation between Jesus and one of the sisters of Lazarus, we are able to discover that one of those sisters of Lazarus, I think it's Martha, she had faith. For instance, she had faith in resurrection. She act, and she had faith also in miracles. Because she told Jesus Christ that, Lord, if you had been here, my brother was not going to die. In other words, she believed that Jesus Christ was able to stop death from taking place. She had that belief within herself. But that belief was not enough. For, I mean, that belief was depending on someone. It was not enough to stop death in itself. Hallelujah. 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 So you develop faith and capacity when you are outside of problems. Just like this wise man who built his house upon a rock. I want to remember when a KP foundation first went to Alabama City, that's what people were saying. This man is crazy. What is he doing? He's finishing all the mattocks. He has finished all the mattocks in the shop. Most probably used 20 mattocks to dig a foundation on a rock. But the man knew what he was doing. He knew that there was a thunderstorm which was coming. There were floods which were coming. Hallelujah. And the rock is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hallelujah. The house that you are building, it is your faith life. Say, the house that I'm building is my faith life. So where is your faith life based? Some people's faith lives are based on their job. So when their job vanishes, they start to go to Nangas and other people in, to look for solutions. Because their faith was never based on Jesus Christ in the first place. Their faith was actually based on a job. If your faith is based on a job, it is like this second house which was built on sand. Because a job can be there today and then it can disappear tomorrow. The same job can give you US dollars today and then tomorrow it will be giving you bond notes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It can start by giving you Zim dollars. And then it gives you multi-currencies or U.S. dollars. And then later on, the same job can decide that she's supposed to earn bond notes. What will you do if your faith is based on your job? It means your faith will begin to crash now. Or your faith will be destroyed. So our faith must not rest on our qualifications. Because our qualifications can disappoint us. I want us to say our faith must not be based on our qualifications. But it must be based on Jesus Christ. Because our qualifications can disappoint us. Your faith must not be based on fellow human beings. Because fellow human beings can change at any time. And fellow human beings can die at any time. Fellow human beings can lose capacity at any time. Hallelujah. I know of people who when their employers died, they also collapsed. Only to be resuscitated in hospital. Because their faith for a good life will be based on the employer. And when the employer dies, their world and their heaven would have collapsed. Your faith must rest on Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Who doesn't die, who doesn't grow old who doesn't diminish in terms of capacity or strength. Hallelujah. Because Jesus Christ is telling us here, he's saying, therefore whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. So when we hear the message of Jesus Christ, we must have faith in the message of Jesus Christ. Some people, when they hear the message of Jesus Christ, they begin to reason that uh, what, what the pastor is saying, we know he is reading the Bible, but what the pastor is saying doesn't work in my case. The pastor is busy telling me that if you are a believer, you must have a relationship with another believer. But I already have my relationship at Makokova or at Kingsdale, or I already have a relationship with someone at Pennside who doesn't belong to Jesus Christ. He doesn't go to church. He drinks a bit during functions. How do you know that he drinks a bit when you don't stay with him? He drinks a bit during functions, but generally he's a nice man. 
the pastor doesn't know this man. I mean, whatever the pastor is reading from the Bible doesn't apply to my boyfriend or my girlfriend. Do you think you can be wiser than God? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to look at your neighbor and ask them, do you think you can be wiser than God? Ask them for the last time. Say, do you think you can be wiser than God? Sometimes in our thinking, we may think that we can be wiser than God. When God speaks something, we can show it to others. Hallelujah. 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 I want you to confess and say I can never be wiser than God. That's one thing which is that's one of the many things which is impossible to a human being. No matter how much level of faith you have, you can't be wiser than God. It is not possible. It will mean that God is just a, a created entity. And God, God is the creator. He doesn't have a creator of himself. He doesn't have a beginning and he doesn't have an end. Gala mama, gala babu. Gala koko. Unkul unkul is one person. Ongela mama, ongela babu. Just try to imagine yourself in that situation. You don't have a mother and a father. You are the only explanation why you exist. God is the only explanation why he exists. He is the only being that is, whose existence is propelled from within. Hallelujah. He is the only being whose existence can be explained by who he is. That's why it's necessary to, to praise and worship God. When we are praising and worship God, we are not adding anything to God. We are simply acknowledging who he is. I want us to confess and say, when we are praising and worshiping God, we are not adding anything to him. We are simply acknowledging who he is. Because there are some people that think that when they are not in church, Somehow God is going to be something dead. Let me tell you, my brother and my sister, if all the angels in heaven, and it will never, what I'm just about to speak will never take place. But I'm creating a hypothetical situation in order to emphasize a point. If all the angels in heaven, and it's not only angels that live in heaven, if you read the book of Revelation and the book of Ezekiel, if all the angels in heaven and living creatures, there are, there are creatures which are not angels, which are called living creatures in heaven, some of which have got eyes all over the pot, which are not necessarily angels. They, they are not sent here to the earth. They just live there in heaven. If all the living creatures in heaven, living beings in heaven, and all the angels, the various classes of angels in heaven, were to hold a strike, and decide not to worship God. Maybe for 10 minutes or for 10 years or whatever. And then all the human beings on the earth decide not to worship God. Do you know what will happen? You will still remain God. Did you understand what I told you? You will still remain God. Hallelujah. forever. We know according to the book of Revelation, they are angels in a certain part of heaven. Because heaven, heaven is like, um, is like um, a city. It is like a city. It has got different, for want of a better word, I can say it is, it is like a city which has got different suburbs. When Jesus Christ says, in my father's house, house there, the word translated house, was not really supposed to be translated house. Because it means a dwelling place. Heaven, you know heaven is not a house like this room which you are occupying, it's a house. It's just a, a very vast place. Because 
we see in Daniel there, I think it's Daniel chapter 7, we see hundreds of millions of angels that were serving as ushers near the throne of God. 100 million angels. When God was inaugurating Jesus Christ as the King of Kings in heaven, after he resurrected back to heaven, when he was inaugurated as a king there, announced in heaven as a king, when he came with the clouds of heaven as a king, such that today we call him the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Bible tells us in the book of Daniel that there were 100 million angels near the throne, not all the angels in heaven, but the angels that were participating in that ceremony near the throne of God, there were 100 million. So you can imagine 100 million angels, they can't fit in a house. Even God himself, the Bible says he can't fit in a, in a, in a house or in a small place. Because even the heavens cannot contain him. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So when we look at heaven, when it says in my father's house there are many mansions, the word translated mansions there, again, it's for want of a better word because the reality is in heaven. They cannot be translated in terms of words which we use here on earth. The word which is translated mansions there, it's a Greek word mone, which means realms of existence. Say realms of existence. So in heaven, there are different realms of existence. You will find in heaven angels that are releasing judgment, like those angels that were pouring powers of God's wrath here on earth. And then at the same time, the Bible will tell you of angels which are always saying, holy, holy, holy forever, which, which are never silent. They were created for that purpose. They are in another, I mean, mone, or in another realm of existence. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when you have got that understanding about how great God is, you are inspired to have faith in God. Because you know that God is wiser than you. Hallelujah. You know that God can never tell you something which is not for your own good. Whatever God tells you in his word, it is for your own good. Like there was a time when God decided to send Elijah to a to a widow that was living in a place called Zarephath. Say Zarephath. Say Zarephath. I almost say to Zimbabwe next year will, represent, will, will mirror Zarephath, but then I just held myself back. <laughs> I almost say to that. Look at your neighbor and say, in 2017, are you going to operate like the widow of Zarephath? Or you are going to reason carnally? You know, when Elijah was sent to the widow of Zarephath, God said, go to a land. He caused a certain stream that was supplying Elijah with water for bathing and drinking. He caused it to dry up. A, a stream called Cherith or a brook called Cherith, it dried up. And then the ravens, they stopped bringing food, bread and meat to Elijah. And then God says, I've appointed a widow to, look, to take care of you. But now when you read the story very well, you discover that God was, was, was actually interested in sustaining the wheat. When you read the story very well. Because when Elijah arrives in the, in the land of Zarephath there, he found the widow looking for twigs, looking for inkuni, looking for firewood, so that she could cook her last meal. And then afterwards, she would just wait to die with her son. Hallelujah. So God was, didn't really want, I mean, was not really intending to sustain Elijah because he had many methods of sustaining Elijah. But God was interested in sustaining the widow woman. And when Elijah arrives, because God wanted to test the faith of that woman, Elijah arrives like a selfish person. I mean, those who have read the story, if you have read the story, lift up your hand. The story of Elijah in the land of Zarephath. Those who have read that story. When Elijah arrives, he says, I need water from the land. 
when the, when the lady is moving to go and fetch water, Elijah says, make a cake for me and bring it. The woman starts to say, but we are making our last meal. He says, make a cake for me. When? First. He appeared like a selfish man, but in reality, God wanted to sustain the wheat. If the woman had said, ah, you men, I don't even know who you are. You are a stranger and you are saying, I must take some of my meal and make a cake for you. I don't even know who you are. She was going to eat that meal and then die afterwards with her son. So when it comes to the things of God, you must not reason, cannot. Hallelujah. I want you to say when it comes to the things of God, don't reason, cannot. If the wheat of Zarephath was carnal, she was going, because Elijah, the of God. Because the of God, the reason, because if you read the Hebrew tradition of these people who were called men of God, they didn't live among people. They were living alone, meditating in the bush and praying there. When they came to where other people lived, they would be delivering a message. When they saw a man of God. Hallelujah. Most of, most of the ministers of the gospel who are called men of God, they are not really men of God. Hallelujah. They are not really men of God in the sense of a man of God in the Old Testament. A man of God in the Old Testament was living a very difficult life. Some of those people who were called men of God, most of them, they were not married. They couldn't marry. A person like Elijah who could go and live during a drought in the bush, just imagine, how can such a person be married? That's, that's the picture of a man of God now. Most of what people call men of God are actually pastors, apostles, and so on. There are very few people in the New Testament, if there are any, who are actually men of God. Maybe Singapore, Africa, young cases are told, maybe men of God is only maybe one person in the whole of Africa. What qualifies to be called a man of God? Because a man of God, this man of God cannot be a man of the people. It means he spends most of his time with God. Hallelujah. Amen. For him to be called a man of God, he is spending most of his time talking to God. They talk to God almost like God is physical. This man of God. It's a very lonely life to be a man of God. For Elijah, who was living in the bush there by the brook Cherith, or by the stream of Cherith there, it was a lonely life until God told him to go to the wheat of Zarephath. Let us take the wheat of Zarephath when Elijah is coming. She's a widow, she's in a vulnerable position. And then a man who has been living in the bush for quite some time, he is coming. And he's saying, I want some water. If she was carnal, she would say, I'm a widow. Most probably this man wants a relationship with me. She was going to reason that way and miss her blessing. She could have given Elijah a cold salt to say this fierce man, and they used to keep a long beard, those men of God, and the long hair. Most of them were Nazarites. Hallelujah. Most of them were Nazarites. They didn't cut their hair, and they didn't cut their beard. The beard would be long. They would be fierce. These men of God. So, so. Now, Funugubona, the closest to a man of God, who can a lama post or rather for Indev Lava. That's how, of course, Labo for Tindev Zankona Zabe Kazmula. Imagine the men of God, they used to live in the bush, Zazna Kazmul Indev Zabal and Eleza, because they lived in, in the bush seeking the presence of God. And then this woman, because God had already prepared her heart by faith, she was able not to ask a lot of questions. She could have decided to say, you want bread from me and you want to live with me and I'm a widow. 
Where is your wife? Where is your family? She never asks those questions because she was not thinking carnally. So for your faith to work, there are certain questions which you must never ask God. If you begin to ask those questions, you are busy disqualifying yourself. If God says he comes to you in a dream and he tells you that uh, you must uh, plant a certain seed, maybe somewhere, maybe to a relative or to a certain place, you must assist someone. He can come in your heart and tell you that you must pay fees maybe for someone, a relative. And then if you are not careful, you, must, you may start to ask, but this person has got a parent who gets more money than myself. Why should I pay fees for her? Why should I pay fees for him? By so doing, by reasoning, carnal, you are disqualifying yourself self from the blessing that God has for you. Hallelujah. I want us to say when God speaks to me, I'm not going to reason, carnal. Say when God talks to me, I am not going to reason, carnal. I am going to reason like a spiritual person. Hallelujah. When Jesus Christ received the Holy Spirit at the river Jordan there, and the Holy Spirit led him to the wilderness, he didn't start asking questions. Holy Spirit, what are we going to do in the wilderness? There are no houses there. I've never lived in the wilderness. He didn't start to argue with the Holy Spirit. Why are you leading me to the wilderness? Why am I going to the wilderness, Holy Spirit? Why must I spend 40 days in the wilderness? Because when you are doing that, when you are doing that, you will be busy disqualifying yourself from the glamorous paths of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. When you start to ask a lot of nonsensical questions, because questions which are carnal are actually nonsensical questions to the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When you start to ask a lot of questions, Katvele Church is Nigelelan. It's Nigelelan. Lapa Mbonang and Trust notice our fundis. Kumben Lapa Mbonang and Trust notice the church. The church is still a mortal. It's really a tiny building. But those same people sing at the same school and they let again Lapa Nas Netto Lizul. But she was a civil church, civil Lamantaba, a long fundis of fundless civil among us and let again says Netto Lizul. Each church I'm going to contribute much so that we can acquire a building to start to criticize the same church because you are reasoning carnal, you are not operating by faith. When you are operating by faith, when God speaks to you, you don't gain say or ask silly questions about what God is saying. If God tells you to go to the mountain to pray, you just go to the mountain. You don't question God. If God tells you to visit a certain person and pray for her, you don't first start by asking whether they are in trouble. Maybe they will be in trouble next week. Or they were in trouble last week and trouble is coming again. Don't ask questions. Operate like a soldier. I want you to say I'm a soldier of the cross. Let us go to my, my last issue, which I postponed last week. I want us to look at the story of the blind Bartimaeus. I want you to say, when Jesus calls me, I will operate like the blind Bartimaeus. We had simple faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Say, when Jesus Christ calls me, I will operate like the blind Bartimaeus. Let us go to Mark chapter 10. I'm now concluding. Because that's where I was supposed to actually conclude. But uh, I realize it's almost a fast form. So I want people to pray their meat when there is still time. I'm going to just to pray for one or two people. But uh, I'm going to pray for people in detail on the 31st of December. So if you want me to pray for you in detail, or to counsel you, or to speak a word of wisdom, or a word of knowledge. I will flow more in the word of knowledge gift and the word of wisdom gift and also prophecy gift on the 31st of December. That's, that's what God has told me. Hallelujah. Because I don't do what I want. 
I do what God wants. Hallelujah. Even if I wanted to resurrect the dead, if God doesn't want them to resurrect, I would be wasting my time. Hallelujah. Verse 46. Mark chapter 10, verse 46. Now they came to Jericho. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great multitude and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, I wanted to underline the word head. Say head. Say head. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Just imagine, this man didn't know Jesus because he was blind. And this man had no way of proving that it was really Jesus. He could have imagined, in a, I mean, he could, he could have just decided to be silly and say, maybe it's not Jesus, maybe it's a celebrity. Maybe it's the Kanye West of that time. Who is moving? Near Jericho then. He could have re decided to reason like that. Do you realize? After all, he was blind. He had no direct way of proving that it was Jesus Christ. Even if he was brought to Jesus, he had never seen Jesus because he was a blind man. So he had no direct way of ascertaining. Even if he could hear Jesus preaching, that it was Jesus who was preaching. Because he was a blind man. So he had to rely on others. So if you check in your life, there are many instances where you have to rely on others so that they tell you that God wants things to be done in this way. A pastor can come and tell you that the Holy Spirit is saying, before you embark on a journey, first of all, fast for three days. I've had situations where I tell people, I won't be even knowing that they are planning for a change. I just tell them by the Holy Spirit, what is showing me you traveling out of town? He is saying you must postpone your journey by one or two days and commit yourself to fasting and reading the word of God. And because this person will be so eager to travel, later on they phone me wanting me to change the message. Do you know what I normally do? I change it. Because they won't be understanding what spiritual life is all about. If they phone me and they want me to change the message which God has spoken, what will I do? I'll simply change it. Isn't it they will be interested in the change itself? They will be interested in the change itself. If you want to change what God has established, God will allow you to change it. How do I know that? If you read the book of Genesis, you realize that in Genesis chapter 2, God created the male and female. But at a certain point, one of the descendants of Adam, who is called Lamech, he married two wives. God just allowed it. I want you to say God just allowed it. And then later on, people like Solomon, they arrive and he's got 700 wives and uh, so many other women, such that in total he has got around 1,000 wives. God just allowed it. And he gave him wisdom in the midst of that foolishness. Gave him a lot of wisdom. And those wives, especially the Egyptian ones, they persuaded him to worship idols, such that towards the end of his life or his reign, he was actually, he turned his heart from God and he began to worship idols because he was being persuaded by his wives. That God had allowed. If you allow something, God will also allow it. Hallelujah. But in the meantime, he would have told you that you should do things in a certain way. So never think that God, that God will come physical and say, Busi, thus says the Lord, next week you must fast for 14 days from next week. And then every day you must be praying for such and such a number of hours. Then the voice disappears. He will tell someone, because the blind man, Patimias, he ate from others. He ate a lot of noise. I mean, he could deduce that it was a large crowd, even though he was a blind man. From the feet and the noise that people were making as they were moving with Jesus, he could deduce that this is a very great multitude. And then he asked, where are these people going to? Someone told him, they are following Jesus. 
And then when he heard that they are following Jesus of Nazareth, he remembered that this is a man who was performing miracles and resurrecting the dead and healing the sick. He started to cry. And the way and manner in which he is crying is very prophetic. He doesn't say Jesus, son of Joseph. Do you realize? He says Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But he's acting on a message. I want you to say he's acting on a message. That he heard from others. And then let us continue the story. Then many warned him to be quiet because he was disturbing Jesus. Jesus had a habit of preaching as he was moving. He didn't, Jesus was not religious. Most of what we do in our churches, it's not, it doesn't even reflect what Jesus Christ was doing on earth. Because Jesus would arrive at a place like Seussil, without planning a crusade, he would begin preaching. If they bring to him those who are sick, he would begin healing them. He didn't plan for two weeks in order to do a crusade. If the Holy Spirit told him to go to Manemo or to Kulman Complex, he would go there and there. He didn't argue with the Holy Spirit or tell the Holy Spirit stories that we, we want the present worship team to first of all practice so that uh, it will sing very well at the crusade. He, he didn't reason like that. He just listened to the, the Spirit of God and he would do what the Spirit of God wanted. And he had a habit of preaching as he was moving. So even in this incident, it's highly likely that Jesus Christ was preaching as he was moving. That's why they told this blind Bartimaeus to be quiet. Hallelujah. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. If you have got a problem and you have got a message that Jesus Christ can solve your problem, you must cry out. Even if people laugh at you in your family. There was a time when some of my relatives were laughing at me. I was at the inn. A figure 30, 30, cut us more than 40 years old. I want to have a predict to him, figure 30, and have a Sankala, Liruba Umzalwan. And so Zenkala. I want you to say, and so Zenkala. Say, I will never give up. The only way I will stop, I mean, shouting the name Jesus in my life, it is when I've passed away from this world. And the only thing which you are seeing is a corpse. Because what you are seeing is my physical body. You are not seeing, I will You are only seeing my physical body, which is being animated by me. Hallelujah. I made a resolution when I was relatively younger than what I am, that I am going to worship God in season and out of season. Whether the economy crumbles to dust, I will worship God because I'm not worshiping God for man. I'm not worshiping God for marriage. I was worshiping God before I married. I'm not worshiping God for children. I was worshiping God before I had any children. I'm not worshiping God for a house or for a car. I was worshiping God when I didn't have those things. I'm worshiping God because he created me. Hallelujah. You must arrive at a point where you say as a believer, I will praise Jesus. Whether he heals me or he doesn't heal me, he's still my healer. Your faith must arrive at that level. That I believe that Jesus Christ is my healer, whether he heals me or he doesn't heal me. I believe that Jesus Christ is my giver, whether he gives me or he doesn't give me. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord, even if I don't feel his presence. Hallelujah. Unless and until you arrive at that level of faith, you won't be able to triumph over most of life's problems. Some of us, we made a decision. When we were going through very difficult problems, that we were going to worship God. Not because of the U.S. dollar. We were worshiping God before the U.S. dollar. Even if the U.S. dollar were to vanish, and it will not vanish, I am here to tell you as your brother that the U.S. dollar will not vanish. Hallelujah. It may just reduce in quantity in terms of circulation, but it will not vanish. But even if it were to vanish, I will still worship God because I'm not worshiping God for U.S. dollars. I am worshiping God because he is my heavenly father. I want you to confess and say, I am worshiping God. Because he is my heavenly father. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. To the blind Bartimaeus, Jesus Christ was son of David. Whether his eyes were open or closed, it didn't change his appreciation of Jesus. For some of us now, if Jesus Christ doesn't provide you with a boyfriend or a girlfriend, he ceases to be Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You no longer be acknowledging Jesus Christ. Just because your job has delayed, just because your breakthrough has delayed, the delay of your breakthrough is to test your faith. Say the delay of my breakthrough. It is to test my faith. Not to destroy it. Say the delay of my breakthrough. Is to test my faith. Not to destroy it. God is not seeking to destroy your faith, but is seeking to, 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 to strengthen it. Because when he gives you the breakthrough, what is going to keep the breakthrough? It is your faith. Without faith, you won't be able to keep the breakthrough. Hallelujah. Because you need discipline to keep breakthrough. For you to be able to withstand breakthrough. I know of a certain very rich man who is rumored to be having more than 50 children just because he has a lot of money. Hallelujah. Amen. A man, just imagine, a modern man, not a man during the time of Nziligans, but a man during our times. Who is rumored, it's just a room, I'm just telling you a room. Who is rumored to be having more than 50 children. Hallelujah. Amen. Because of man. But now if God has strengthened your faith, you will be able to resist the temptation of man. Because if you have a lot of money as a man, women will be just, I mean, passing all over you. I'm not saying women are loose. Hallelujah. But if you check Solomon and his wealth, and the 1,000 wives will begin to understand what happens if you have got a lot of wealth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Maybe you are a sister. If you acquire a lot of this world, these material things, and your faith has not been strengthened by God, you may develop pride. You start to say, I don't mingle with so and so, and then you, you change all of your, your friends like someone who is changing clothing. Not according to the direction of God, but because of pride which has been developed by the money that you now have. Because money should not change our current. I want us to say money should not change our current. Hallelujah. Verse 49. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer. Rise, he is calling you. I want you to look at your neighbor and say, Jesus is calling you. Out of your problem. And then throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus Christ is asking you this afternoon, what do you want me to do for you? He is asking you that question. The blind man said to Jesus, Raponi, that I may receive my sight. Or Rabbi, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. What do we learn from the blind Bartimaeus? What, do we learn, what, what are we learning from the blind Bartimaeus? The, the first thing which we learn from the blind Bartimaeus is that true faith speaks. Hallelujah. Amen. True faith is never silent. Your faith which is silent about your situation, it is not really faith, it is hope. If you want your situation to change, but you don't say anything about your situation, you don't have faith, you have got to hope. If you have got true faith, true faith speaks. Say true faith speaks. True faith speaks. And then the next thing which we learn from the story of blind Bartimaeus is that true faith gets answers from God. If you cry out to Jesus in true faith, 
He will recognize you and he will answer you. Hallelujah. Amen. And then the next thing which we get from the blind Bartimaeus, or the next lesson that we learn from the blind Bartimaeus, the third one, is that true faith acts now. I am going to go next week. When it receives a revelation, it acts now. It cries out to Jesus now. Just imagine if the blind Bartimaeus had said, no, you know I've been begging since morning. I can't shout out at this man whom I don't even know. I will shout after 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, Jesus will be at his end. Because he was moving, he was not at a standstill. So in life, sometimes you get an opportunity to cry out to Jesus for your life to break through. We call those moments Kairos moments. Like right now, God has opened the heavens, right now in this service. Just for a brief period, very soon, the moment that I'm talking about. You can decide to cry out to Jesus and you receive your healing. You can decide to cry out to Jesus and you receive your financial breakthrough. You can decide to cry out to Jesus and you receive the breakthrough in your career. Hallelujah. But by all means, you must exploit this Kairos moment. Because ordinarily we live in time which is called Kronos. It's called Tesla and Lana. I would not change a Saturday. Sasa is Sunday, it's Kronos. But what I'm talking about, it's a timey, a time period or a, 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 a time reckoned from the point of view of God of eternity. It just opens windows of opportunity for our lives to experience change. And some miss those opportunities. But I'm here to tell you by the word of God that during this time, when I give you the opportunity to pray, don't say I'm too sick to Speak to God. Speak to God in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Speak to God in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then the next thing which we learn from that story is that the Lord Jesus stood still to heal him. That Jesus Christ will listen to you and he will give you time to solve your problem as long as you exercise faith in him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then the other thing which we learn from the story of the blind Bartimaeus is that the answer to the question of Jesus. Sometimes Jesus does not immediately solve your problem, even though he is seeing your problem. He can ask you a lot of questions. Sometimes the questions, they may not be direct questions. He may allow events to ask you certain questions in your character. You may say, I want a husband. He may start to ask you questions through circumstances. Do you really need marriage? You may pray, Lord Jesus, give me a, a courtly man. And then all of a sudden, there are ten men who are chasing you. Jesus Christ will be interested in knowing whether you can really stay in a marriage. Now, if you start to date five of those men, who are around so at ten one time, you have just told Jesus that you don't qualify for a marriage. And so Jesus Christ will ask you a question so that he can see whether you are the right place for his breakthrough to, 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 to come upon. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ said, what do you want me to do for you? Just imagine. I mean, when you are listening to Jesus, the man is blind. Why are you asking him that question? It seems so obvious that the man is blind. What he needs is sight. Hallelujah. But Jesus Christ was asking that question to diagnose the character, whether he was now ready for his miracle. If you answer the questions that Jesus Christ asks you through circumstances and situations, and to tell him that you are not yet ready for your miracle, he will not give you your miracle. No matter how much the pastor likes you, and he wants you to have the miracle. You have to answer the questions of Jesus precisely and what? Properly. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus, you may say, Jesus, Jesus, I need a job. Jesus, I need a job. And then Jesus brings along love. present. And then on top of figure wouldn't give one hundred dollars. Yes, they would tie the one hundred dollars on our savings. You've just told Jesus, I am I don't want a job. Do you get where I'm going? You'd have just told Jesus, 
Jesus, if you give me a job, the job will be working for me and my family, and we are not associated in my job. If you take the $100 and you eat all of it, and you don't contribute anything to the house of God, and you forget about the same God that you wanted, I mean, a blessing from, you'll be telling Jesus, you see, Jesus, I just want blessings from you. I don't want anything. I don't want to give you anything when I get the blessings. And Jesus will say, so can we really give this one financial breakthrough? Let us look for another one. And Jesus Christ does not run out of looking for another one. I wanted to say Jesus does not run out of looking for another one. I know it's English, which is grammatically wrong, but I'm just phrasing it that way. I know some people, they abuse Romans chapter 11, verse 29, that the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. And then they assume that if, God, if they are Christians, God will all, is duty-bound to keep them as Christians. You are deceived. When read the story of Judas Iscariot, who was substituted by Matthias. Where is Judas Iscariot in the book of Acts chapter 2? He's dead out of suicide. Because why more chai opportunity anywhere in Kulunkul? God allowed him to kill himself. Hallelujah. God allowed him to kill himself. He committed suicide. And this position was occupied by a person who was fit for that position. God is not desperate. When King Saul was told to go and kill the Amalekites, all of them and their animals, to kill everything, to destroy everything. And he decided to disobey God because of the voices of the people. God said, I'm finished with this man. I am now anointing a king among the sons of Chess. He chose David. Not even a person who was a politician, but a person who was looking after sheep. To show, to show King Saul that it was not because of any special ability in him that he was king over Israel. But it was because of divine election. So if, if God has ordained you to occupy a certain position, he can substitute you anytime. That's how I serve God. I serve God like today is my last day. Why? Because I know God can substitute me at any time. God can substitute us at any time. All of us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When Peter... You know, Peter, there was a time when he experienced a vision. When, when the people were sent by Cornelius were coming to his house, where he was renting. He experienced a vision of all sorts of animals because he was hungry. And he was told to kill one of the animals and eat it. Three times he said those animals were unclean. But the animals, they represented the Gentiles. And when he said that, he just disqualified himself from being, from being an apostle of the Gentiles. He's the one who was supposed to be an apostle of the Gentiles. And when he was at Antioch, because God gives you a second chance, when he was at Antioch, he was given an opportunity to minister to the Gentiles at Antioch. Hallelujah. He was given an opportunity to minister to the Gentiles at Antioch. When the Jews came from Jerusalem, he began to separate himself from the Greeks at Antioch. Hallelujah. And people from other nationalities. And God had to raise up the Apostle Paul. Actually, the Apostle Paul rebuked him for separating from the Gentiles. Hallelujah. So originally, it was supposed to be Peter who was supposed to be our apostle. He was disqualified because he answered the question that God posed to him wrongly. So when God poses a question to you, like the question that he posed to the blind Bartimaeus, through circumstances and situations, answer the question accurately. Hallelujah. When God asks you, are you prepared for 2017? You must answer that question accurately and properly. You start to read the word of God. You start to pray. You may not even need to fast me. You start to pray. You start to sanctify each month of 2017. You start to say, God, I'm victorious. Even if the economy crumbles, there is an economy in heaven which will sustain me and my relatives. There is an economy in heaven which will sustain me and my children. There is an economy in heaven which will sustain me and my family. 
I will not be famished. I will not go hungry. I will be sustained by you. You will be answering the question, are you prepared for 2017? You don't prepare for 2017 by going to a Chinese shop to, to look for those firecrackers to make noise on New Year's Day. That's not preparation for New Year. That's a dull man's preparation for New Year. You prepare for the New Year by praying. If you are able to fast, because right now it's during the festive season, it may not be wise for you to fast abanyabantu be sidlanka especially abanyaba be hlezi lezinye ihlobo ke abe soke ukuba religious okudlula amalawulo uyatayimela nje xa isikhathi sesi right maybe after christmas kungasekho imbhikisho ukuthi abantu bayadla kakhulu kudla and then you just i mean you just organize some time for you to consecrate yourself to god maybe for 3 days or for 2 2 days before 2017 arrives you look for a secluded spot where you will be talking to 2017 and telling God that 2017 is my successful year. I'm not going to sink under economic problems or any types of problems. Let us rise up. Father, we thank you even as we conclude this message. We thank you that you are a good God. We thank you, living spirit, ancient of days. Libra Hasoda. Zambre meste kina sosto komo. Zambre nde kesita kibosai. Father, we bless.